for about two years in the early 90s. It was transformed from a family-friendly town just outside Saskatoon into Canada's most notorious address. Martinsville, it seemed, had become infested with devil worshippers, child sex abusers, maybe even satanic killers. All too weird to believe? Well, no. Not at first, and not for a long time. For months and months, there was hell to pay as lives were turned upside down with arrests, sensational charges, trials. Tonight, for the first time, the Fifth Estate will show you what went wrong. We'll hear from those at the heart of the case and show you videotape that's never before been broadcast. It's dead of night, April 24th, 1992. A local cop and his partner are on high alert. They've been warned terrible things could happen that night, possibly even human sacrifice. A gang with ties to the occult is supposed to be heading for Martinsville. Constable Mike Swan is packing every gun he can find on orders from the chief. And he authorized us to go ahead and bring in our own guns and just be as heavily armed as possible. And at the time, I've got to admit that I had never been more scared in my life. The chief tells his men he got a tip. There's a hit list and a Martinsville family is on it. As the night wears on, Swan worries about what will happen if he doesn't make it home that night. I told a friend of mine if something did happen to me that he would make sure that Barb and the kids were looked after. In the end, no one dies. The satanic gang never shows up. And in the light of day, the whole threat would seem bizarre. But by this time, Martinsville was already six months into a nightmare where nothing is too strange. It all began with a mother's grave suspicion. She was a nurse at a Saskatoon hospital. One day in the fall of 1991, she finished her shift and drove the 15 minutes home to Martinsville, a place with small town values and where lots of families had young kids. When she worked in the city, she sent her three to the babysitters just a few streets away. The house was full of kids from infants to grade schoolers. The babysitter's husband worked at a provincial jail. His friends were cops. It seemed perfect. But at bath time that night, the mother noticed something peculiar. Her two-year-old had had diarrhea, so she expected a diaper rash. But the redness and chafing around her daughter's genitals looked like something more. When she questioned her daughter, the little girl said, a stranger poked at my bum with a pink rope. And that was the last ordinary day in Martinsville for some time. Town police took the mother's complaint and immediately assigned their newest constable, Claudia Bryden, barely out of police college. She wondered if one child may have been abused, what about the others? So she tracked down more parents whose kids went to the same babysitters. I'm not even sure anymore. It's a long time this mother sent her five-year-old there. She wants her identity hidden to protect him. Seen that long. Back then, when police first called, she couldn't believe the babysitter might be involved. So she phoned and asked. And I can remember being on the phone and I'm just crying and I'm saying, tell me that it's not true. You know, nothing happened, with, you know. And of course, you know, all that they could say was, no, no, nothing's going on. They don't know what they're talking about. Nothing going on. That's what the kids said too, at first. But when Bryden teamed up with the Saskatoon police officer, Rod Moore, they extracted frightening details. Bit by bit, the kids said they were fondled and forced into oral sex, that a vibrator was pushed up their bottoms and that guns were used to threaten them. And where did this happen? At the babysitters. If that wasn't enough, one kid began to talk about another place, a place the children were driven to, a place he called the Devil Church. 
When that leaked out, a local pilot flying over Martinsville said he'd found the place. He would tell police it was a blue building, six kilometers northwest of town. I guess the worst part of it was when, you know, when he was saying that how they would get the building. that building and they'd get put in the van and they'd have black sheets of paper, you know, to cover the windows. And it was here that the story spun into madness. Inside the Devil Church, one kid said he was stripped naked, hoisted in a cage, and poked at. Still others said an axe handle was shoved up their bottoms. Several kids said they were stuffed in a freezer, and one said he was abused on a waterbed. And they were threatened never to tell their parents. And they were totally helpless and like with the threats that they got. You know, they were gonna kill their mom and cut their mom's legs off. As terrible as that was, the investigators heard more. As the months wore on, the children said they remembered uniforms and police cars. They said it wasn't just the babysitters who abused them, it was the very people sworn to protect them. From photos, the kids picked out police officers from three different forces, and the case suddenly turned inward. Watch how a police camera captured the very moment a Saskatoon officer was told he too was a suspect. What is it then? There's something going on there. That was the reason. Okay, well then you know. You are a no, I scanned it. I'm not threatening you. I'm telling you. Don't you threaten me. I'm not and don't threaten tell me that I'm involved in Martinsville. Ten minutes later, he's angrier. Okay, you know what I feel like doing right now? I'm so mad. I'm gonna pop you one. Okay? I can understand. Yeah, I'm gonna pop you one. Okay. Soon, it's pleading. Okay, there's nothing I can do to change your mind. You think it's there. It's not there. Yeah, we're both of the same nature, you see? It's not there. And then he breaks. Okay. Uh, you cool? No, I just scared. Terry, I'm scared. Okay, okay, okay. By spring 1992, Martinsville was reeling. Sex abuse, first at the neighbors, then the devil church. Add cops as conspirators, and then throw in Satan. Rumors of a satanic cult in town, the Brotherhood of the Ram, and among its members, police officers. That got the attention of the chief of police. He would report that one source told him two local children have been selected on a hit list as possible human sacrifices. And Mike Johnston would write in his notes, it would appear that there is a very strong satanic group in the area. In town, whispers were now in the open. Rumors accepted as fact. Nothing was more heinous than hurting kids and now Satan and the police were wrapped up in it too. It was an explosive story, and of course, it lured the press. At the Saskatoon Star Phoenix, Bill Peterson was publisher. And it just sort of grew and grew and grew to a point where there was a level of panic or hysteria right throughout the community. No question the media shared in that panic. I think there was a degree of panic, to my eye at least, in the police and, and in the Justice Department. Pent up panic, and then it burst. Under tremendous pressure to do something, Martinsville police pounced. On a morning in June 1992, they rounded up the babysitter, Linda Sterling, and her husband, Ron. You want to get out of my yard right now? Back off. Their 23-year-old son, Travis Sterling, and a young offender were picked up that same day. Next, the cops. One of their own, Martinsville's Jim Elstad, led the parade. Five would eventually be taken in. One of them, John Popowich, who'd gone in one hour from police officer to pedophile. In all, nine people were accused of the most horrible acts against children. It was a triumph for Martinsville's police chief. We're talking uh, sexual assaults, sexual interference, unlawful confinements, uh, point firearms, assaults, aggravated assaults. 
How does this compare with any anything else you've ever been involved with investigation-wise? It doesn't. Uh, I've been a police officer for 25 years, and this uh, this is probably the culmination of all investigations. Back then, Saskatchewan's justice minister was Bob Mitchell. He clearly remembers the day his deputy and a senior justice official came rushing into his office. I mean, they chartered a plane. There's all kinds of ways to go from Regina to Saskatoon without chartering a plane. And they were in a big hurry. They were on their way to the airport because uh, a large number of charges had been presented to the prosecutors in Saskatoon to, uh, in, in what later became the Martinsville, the Martinsville case. Even the Premier, Roy Romano, headed for Martinsville. Meantime, the accused were banished, barred from even visiting the town by order of the court, and the Martinsville case began to wind its way to trial. The first of those trials started in March 1993 in Saskatoon. In the absence of other evidence, the kids' testimony would be crucial. To ensure the children weren't intimidated, a judge ordered a screen to hide them from the accused. And she said, pull down your pants and underwear. So I did. First to be tried was the young offender, whom we still can't name. The town got the verdict it expected, guilty on seven counts. Next up was the Saskatoon cop you saw being interrogated, John Popowich. Armed with similar evidence, the prosecutors may have anticipated the same verdict. But on day eight of that trial, a major turning point. The boys who said Popowich abused them couldn't pick him out in court. The judge called it mistaken identity, and Popowich was freed. That set the stage for the babysitter and her family, and that trial dragged on for five months. In the end, the jury decided Travis Sterling, the son, was guilty, but his parents, Ron and Linda Sterling, were not. We told people at our, the beginning of the hearing that we were not guilty of any charges, and uh, neither is our son, we believe that, and uh, we're going to fight this right to the bitter end. It was not going well for Saskatoon prosecutors Bruce Bauer and Leslie Sullivan, especially with four more cases to come. The judge was quite pointed in his uh, charge to the jury that in many cases there, weren't, there wasn't very much evidence connecting these people to certain incidents at certain places. How does that uh, make your cases feel? in terms of going forward with it. We're not, we're, we're not going to discuss other cases, I'm sorry. Are you prosecuting the next case? Are you yes. going to be in court Monday? But their boss overruled that. There wouldn't be a next case. Saskatchewan Justice has, has announced that a stay of proceedings has been filed with respect to the remaining, remaining four adult, adults charged in the Martinsville case. The Martinsville case was in tatters. When we come back, hell to pay. I'm Susan Ormiston from CBC. Yes, ma'am. I want to talk to you about the Martinsville investigation. Sir? By February 1994, it had dawned on Martinsville that its nightmarish bubble had burst. The courts had ruled there was no devil church, no Satan, no conspiracy of pedophiles. Remember, nine people were charged, and in the end, eight were freed. After appeals, only Travis Sterling, the babysitter's son, would go to jail. And that was for fondling and touching two kids. Serious, but nothing like the legend of ritual abuse. No one was happy, but Saskatchewan's justice minister wanted it buried. In those circumstances, considering all of the circumstances, I, I don't think a public inquiry is appropriate. But as it turns out, the Saskatchewan government couldn't shake the Martinsville saga so easily. One cop sued for malicious prosecution, and bit by bit, we learn more about what went on behind the hysteria in Martinsville. New information reveals there were serious missteps in both the investigation and the prosecution of this case. It could have and should have been stopped, or at least contained, long before it came here to court. Things went wrong right from the start. Remember the stakeout, dead of night, Martinsville police armed and ready? 
the chief had bought in to a rumor that a gang of Satanists were coming by busload, no less, to kill. And he said that he had information obtained from a woman in Saskatoon that placed two busloads of heavily armed Satanists coming up from the Estevan Moose Jaw area. But as dawn approached, and of course, no sign of the devil's bus, Constable Mike Swan and his partner began to feel silly. It just became more and more ludicrous. And uh, if Mike Johnson had actually believed this, then he was setting us up to go down and go down really hard. We just couldn't even conceive what kind of game he was playing. By then, Martinsville's mayor, Rob Friesen, was wondering too, beginning to doubt the man he sat next to, his chief. It seemed to me that the longer it went, the more flags, if you want to call them that, went up that say, hey, this, there's something funny here. There's, there's maybe not as much to this as, as we're led to believe. Mike was very insistent that there was something going on. There was some satanic stuff happening. And there seemed to be no stopping the chief. Remember the big roundup? It was on Johnston's orders that nine people were picked up and charged. Constable Mike Swan arrested his colleague, Jim Elstad, and then took the paperwork to the prosecutor. He said, who's this for? And I said, Jim Elstad. And he says, what the fuck is he doing now? Referring to Johnson. And uh, then he just sort of clammed up and he went in his office. Turned out, the chief jumped the gun. The prosecutors had told him not to arrest anyone until all the evidence was in. They later complained about it in a letter to their boss. Without any authorization by the Crown, Chief Johnston prematurely laid charges and arranged for the arrest of all the accused. Today, Mike Johnston is not a police chief anywhere. His force was disbanded after the Martinsville case collapsed. I'm Susan Ormiston from CBC. Yes, ma'am. I want to talk to you about the Martinsville investigation. Sir? He lives in another town now, and he won't talk about the past. We're, talk about. we're just here because we're talking about the uh, Martinsville investigation. We're wondering when you made the arrests in June, why you made those arrests, and what you think about it now, 10 years later. Sir? You got anything to say about the investigation? In the end, he had to turn over the investigation anyway. It was too big. Saskatchewan Justice had called in a special task force, Operation Foray. At an airport office, senior RCMP and Saskatoon City Police sifted through the evidence. They were trying to shore up nearly 180 charges, and from the start, they had doubts. Former RCMP Staff Sergeant Rick Pearson was the lead investigator. We come along as a task force and we're going to organize the material and we're going to move the investigation forward. But at the end of the day, we start to see flaws of what uh, doesn't seem to hold any water. And we start to question it and uh, analyze it and start to investigate backwards and uh, try and twist and turn what we are looking at to say, well, what do we really have here? What they had were three pillars of evidence on which most of the case was built. They had that mysterious place in the country. They had nine suspects, and they had the children's evidence of horrific crimes. But what we now know is those pillars had weak foundations, and under scrutiny, they would tumble one by one. Remember the blue building, where the kids said they were forced into sex on a waterbed? Where they were abused with an ax handle? put in a freezer and caged, a house of horrors, if it were true. But when it was searched, there wasn't a trace of blood or hair or semen anywhere. Even a special luma light, as it's called, couldn't find anything. The place was clean. When we looked at all the information we had, uh, we started to have our doubts about whether or not children actually had been taken to this location. Some things did not seem right. Indeed, they weren't. On a second look, there was no waterbed. The freezer was used for storing meat, the ax for cutting wood, and the cage to house newly hatched chicks. In fact, none of the kids had ever been there. 
So how did they come up with their stories? Have you seen that building? Turns out, early in the investigation, they were shown pictures of the blue building and the things inside. And over the months, the kids began generating stories about them. The same thing happened with some of the suspects. One child said he remembered a cop driving him to a place in the country. And then from police photos, other children began to point out other officers, and the list of police suspects kept growing. We had uh, um, some names given to us as potential suspects that hadn't yet been pursued in this investigation. And this was some of the new uh, work that we were going to pursue. When we talked to these people, uh, we realized that the, something's not right. Uh, that some of the identifications uh, just were wrong. Like Saskatoon Police Constable Murray Grismer, he was named as a suspect early on. He was suspended from his job and lived in limbo, fearing he too might be charged. You became reclusive in, in so much as we didn't leave our home. And any time somebody would drive on our property, the dog would bark and you'd, want, you'd think, is, is, this, is this the time? Is this, is this the moment when the insanity goes beyond where it has already been? But by then, the tide had begun to turn. Grismer had been off work for 111 days by the time the task force finally cleared him. And I actually think that had the task force not got involved in this, and had those people not had the strength of their convictions to do the right things for the right reasons, we could have seen people go to jail that had no business being there. And that's a, you know, that's a sad comment on our justice system. The head of the task force, Rick Pearson, says that third pillar, the children's interviews, was problematic from day one. And remember, this was the only evidence the prosecution had. The case would be decided on the children's testimony. So this person that was driving, what do you think should happen to this person? I agree. And did you know that um, a policeman that has been accused of touching kids out in Martinsville? Experts who reviewed these tapes, even the prosecution's own expert, said the questions were leading. When the kids gave the right answers, they were rewarded with praise. The tape's poor quality here, but listen closely. As a set, these interviews of these children failed to present information that would provide a basis for any reliable conclusion that any abuse had occurred to any of these children. Dr. David Raskin testified for the babysitter Linda Sterling at her trial. He's an American psychologist with decades of experience evaluating children's statements. He said one of the kids' interviews in particular set the tone. The initial interview was continual denials, even though there was repeated pressure and suggestion and questioning over and over and over again. This child denied and denied and denied. Four days later, the same child was re-interviewed in a very, very uh, suggestive and pressured interview and began to say things. But those ideas had been planted four days previously when the child denied everything. So have you ever been for a ride in Montana Police It was the rookie cop, Claudia Bryden, who interviewed many of these kids over and over. Later, much of the blame for the runaway investigation was heaped on her. Today, she's still a police officer, not in Martinsville, and she wasn't anxious to talk to the Fifth Estate. But she did agree to answer one question. Claudia, you were a relatively new police officer when you took on this major file. Wouldn't it have made sense to ask for some help? Look, um, the fact that I sought my supervisor's assistance and advice throughout the investigation has been a 
part of the public record now for a very long time. It's very clear that, that I did ask for help. Um, the fact, uh, the fact is, uh, I'm just not, I'm just not prepared to, to talk in detail about, about what went on. But that didn't help the prosecutors back in 1992. They knew the interviews might not hold up. Their only option? Do a new set with the same kids and see what happened. In notes, they wrestled with, do we patch our case? Or do we avoid looking like we had a shaky case to begin with and trying to fix it? At that time, uh, in our opinion, we were into somewhat of damage control in that uh, the original evidence was now uh, being reworked with new interviews. Just one month before the first trial, Sergeant Rick Pearson laid it out. He told the prosecutors, in the opinion of the task force, their evidence had holes in three key areas. He put it in writing, opening a rift. Seems well, like you weren't on the same team, that there were two divergent paths here. That's true. Uh, there was uh, criticism, I believe, of the task force in that uh, it didn't go the direction that uh, they wanted it to go. Uh, there was a divergence, uh, particularly, I suppose, between myself and the prosecutors. I was a lead investigator, and uh, I was not going to have my investigators going into areas I thought were uh, impossible to, uh, to get anything out of. You or the task force never stood up and said, stop this investigation. Are you comfortable with that? Uh, maybe in hindsight, I could have stood up and said, stop the train because it's on the wrong track here. But it was too late. There was too much momentum. The Martinsville case would hurtle along until it became not a great moment in Saskatchewan justice history, but a political embarrassment, one the justice minister didn't want to examine. Uh, the conduct of the prosecution, I think, is, uh, is, is not being questioned by anyone. So I'm not sure what it is that we would inquire into. Today, Bob Mitchell is retired from politics. He admits Martinsville was the worst episode in his long career. But he says as a minister, he had to stay at arm's length from the prosecution and claims he didn't know the case was unraveling. I'm hearing this for the first time as you speak to me right now. Do you understand what I mean? What I mean? I mean, I'm hearing this for the first time. That there is this. Uh, that there is this. That there was these doubts or these concerns. One might ask why set up a task force of investigating senior officers if their advice to prosecution is ignored. Yeah, I, that's a good question. I don't have an answer for it. Can you I'm, understand? I'm surprised. I'm surprised that that advice was ignored. It's kind of unusual and distressing, I would think, for many people that the Minister of Justice has to learn this 10 years later. Mm -hmm. in well, an there you have it. Yeah. Uh, you, you've uh, raised some questions that I think impact upon the prosecutorial process. Uh, that's serious stuff. Um, If I had known about those things at the time, I certainly wouldn't have said that in the legislature. Bruce Bauer is still a Crown Prosecutor in Saskatoon, and Martinsville still dogs him. Some of the wrongly accused are suing the province and him. Yeah, it's just that the court, though, if you want to come and talk. Yeah, we're doing a, um, a look into the Martinsville uh, prosecution, and because of, because of those civil suits, his lawyer advised him not to talk to the Fifth Estate but we wanted to approach him directly. And we really think that, you know, you deserve a chance to sort of defend that and no one from the justice will talk about it. Well, it's, there's a number of other uh, cases uh, going ahead right now um, in civil court, so you can't really talk about any of the cases because they're all interconnected, so. Do you think it was a poor prosecution? Well, as I said, I can't really call it any more than that. When we come back, 10 years later, the Martinsville case won't go away for anyone. It's not there. They've often wondered about people who've been accused of something they've never done. Terry, there's nothing there. There's never, I've never done anything like that. I've never even thought of anything like that.
Ten years ago in Martinsville, Saskatchewan, they were the damned. Dear God, damned. I've never been there. Pedophiles, or so the town thought, and no punishment could be too severe. Ron Sterling was a pariah, head of a family that preyed on kids. And this walk would be played over and over on television. You want to get out of my yard right now? Ron Sterling was not guilty, but he paid a high price anyway. That they could believe that they could, we could do anything like that to their children hurts beyond belief. He and his wife, Linda, lost their home in Martinsville. They started over in Prince Albert. Once, he was deputy head of a correctional center. Now, he drives a cab. Right, I need you 118 26 West. Good morning, everybody. Five's in the car. Uh, this is one of the most terrible charges you can face. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's even worse than murder. Murder, there's some excuse for that people seem to accept. This, there is no excuse for. Go ahead. I need you on civil. How do you get over something like this? Our lives are gone. Our reputation is gone. My job is gone. Have you ever thought of moving out of Saskatchewan? No. Why? Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? Well, Why would I want to go someplace else? Somewhere where you're more anonymous? You're not anonymous anywhere. We're still recognizable. I mean, it doesn't matter where we go. There's always somebody who will stop and stare, point a finger. His son, Travis, now 33 years old, was found guilty on two charges. No. Travis did not want to be interviewed. His dad still defends him. Ron, did you ever ask your son if anything happened? No, I didn't have to. I knew he didn't do anything. And I know my family did nothing wrong. How do I prove it? I can't. You're just going to have to believe me. John Popowich can never escape the memories of Martinsville. He was the Saskatoon police officer who 10 years ago was named as a child abuser. Once you're fingered for, uh, as a sexual pervert or a predator of any kind, anything to do with kids and sexual assaults, you're dust. It doesn't matter what happens. As soon as you got that label, you're dust. He'll never forget the day he was on duty at the police station and was suddenly called upstairs. It was the worst day of his life. Look at this interrogation again. What you're watching is an innocent man caught in a trap. I'm not threatening you. I'm telling you. Don't you threaten me. And don't tell me that I'm involved in Martinsville. First he denies. Then the futility sinks in. It's not there. I've often wondered about people being accused of something they've never done. Terry, there's nothing near. There's never, I've never done anything like that. And the full horror hits him. So uh, not, Terry, I gotta. You okay? So oh, I'm not, my. Nothing. I gotta fall game. Six thirty, Terry. I'm gonna lose my two kids. Sorry, guys. The images are too painful, even today. I tried to explain to Terry that as one policeman to another, I wasn't there, didn't do anything. And then when you feel the, the gates of hell closing in around you, you can you, you explain what you can, how you can, and if you get emotional, which I obviously did, you're fighting for your life. John Popowich is closer than ever to his two grown-up daughters. Ten years ago, they were just kids, and he was afraid to even hold them. You'd sit there and watch TV in the afternoon or at night, and you'd turn the Venetians right down so nobody could see in. I was so scared of people watching or, or listening that the girls weren't even allowed to sit on my knee to watch TV like we normally did. Your own daughters? No, that wasn't allowed. They weren't even, like, I wouldn't even allow them to sit on the same couch as me. I was scared. His family stuck by him as he went to court and the case against him dissolved. But he ended up in hospital with a breakdown. I'm going to be on medication for the rest of my life. I will never be able to lead a normal life like you can or 
Anybody else? Come and go as they please. I still got to watch where I go. I still got to watch what I do. And there are still a lot of people out there who point fingers and say I'm guilty. Just as raw are the feelings of the Martinsville families whose children were dragged first through the investigation and then through the courts. Even though the justice system has determined most of the abuse never happened, they still believe it did. Is it possible that the case didn't hold up, that the people charged, in fact, were not guilty? No. That's not even a possibility. Has that ever crossed your mind, even in the 10 years since Martinsville? No. No. What about in your son's mind? Has he, has he changed his thinking in any way about what happened? Not at all. He is still just as angry and upset to this day. This wasn't just a one-day thing or a one-month thing. I mean, we suffered for many years over this. And has it gone away today? No. And that no matter how hard you try to block it out, and forget about it, it, it never goes away. In a way, perhaps, the kids became victims of the investigation itself. According to one expert, repeated interviews designed to get at the truth may have in fact altered the truth, at least in the children's minds. Dr. David Raskin. When someone has no memory of an event because it didn't occur, then it is much easier to suggest to them that something happened, even if it didn't, and for them to accept that suggestion. And the weaker the memory, and the longer the passage of the time, the more easily one can accept as fact something that may never have happened. And that is what very likely happened in this case. This is a situation that requires healing, and uh, Damn it all, if that requires an apology, then somebody should apologize. It sounds to me like a pretty good idea. If I were there, I'd, I'd, I'd want to do that. Would you apologize? If I were there, I'd... I'd no, you have an opportunity. Oh, yeah, I apologize, sure. I mean, I, I just feel sorry for everybody. And if I could contribute to that healing by saying, I really am sorry then I, I want to do that. Do you accept the responsibility for the... I was the minister. I have to accept the responsibility for the whole damn thing, even though I, as I've tried to explain to you, you know, like, these are not loops in which the minister can ever be found to be operating. And yet the system requires that I bear responsibility for it, so I do. And, um, and that's that. The Saskatchewan government is now being held to account for the mistakes of Martinsville. It's being sued for malicious prosecution, which until recently it stubbornly fought on all fronts. Last summer, the province finally settled with John Popovich for $1.3 million. Thank you. The man who gave him the check was former Justice Minister Chris Axworthy. We apologize to Mr. Popovich for the uh, for the effect that um, this has had on his uh, on his his life, and we did that because uh, we uh, we knew it was the right thing to do. And are there others who deserve the same apology, the same? Well, we'll package? wait and see what the settlement uh, arrangements, if indeed settlements are arranged with um, with other. Uh, do you expect uh, they will be? Well, um, I'm not uh, privy to the details of the discussions between the lawyers on behalf of the province and lawyers on behalf of, um, of uh, the, uh, the complainants, but we'll have to wait and see how that ends up. John Popowicz would like to forget most of what happened in Martinsville, but he keeps one memento proudly displayed. It's a framed copy of what Justice Ted Noble said to him when his trial abruptly collapsed. Uh, but the one part is, uh, you have, sir, unfortunately been mistakenly identified. The fact that you were mistakenly identified as one of the accused in such a high-profile case as this should be a grim reminder to all members of society that it can happen to anyone. 
Good luck.